Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Hello, I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rask. And you're listening to the Australian Finance Podcast. A podcast where we talk about money, finance, investing, and all that good stuff. We're helping you invest your time and money better one podcast episode at a time. Yes, so please subscribe if you like the series. And don't forget you can find us on social media. We're on all the platforms. Kate, where can people go? You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Rask Australia. That's R-A-S-K Australia. Mm -hmm. And I'm Owen Rask on Twitter. Or Owen Rask AU on Instagram. Beware the imitators. People like to copy us. Without further ado, let's jump in to today's episode. G'day, Kate. Welcome to this episode of the Australian Fine Arts Podcast. It has come around to that time of year again where we do our 23 ways to save and invest in 2023. Yes, for those that for those that are just playing along for the first time, Kate. Why do we do 23 ways to save and invest in 2023? I feel like there's a pattern there. Can't quite figure it out. What is it? Well, in December of 2020, 2020? Yes, Yes, 2020. 2020, Someone, probably me, had the idea that we should do some ways to save and invest the following year. So we termed it 21 ways to save and invest in 2021. And because it was so popular... We repeated it again with 22 ways to save and invest in 2022. And following that pattern, we've done it for a third time. So we've got plenty of new suggestions in here. Mm-hmm. I'll put the links to the other two episodes because it's always good in January and in December to just sort of refresh yeah. your savings and investing goals for the new year. And it's good to get some inspiration either from this podcast or our Rascore community. People were sharing different ways that they're saving and investing next year and there. Yeah. Um, these are by far our most popular episodes. I should say, excluding the VDHD deep dive t- style stuff, this is the uh, this, this is the good stuff. This is the cream on top of our podcast every year. And so, you can go back to the other two years as well because a lot of them are evergreen, meaning that you can still take all of those ways to save and invest and apply them in addition to these. So, you'd almost have, I don't know, what's that, like 66 ways to save and invest. There you go, Kate. Some on-air maths. The, the maths in quick maths. Well yep. done. And uh, I've uh, these have all been given to me through friends and family. Ooh. Either myself, I've tried them myself, or they've come from our community. So they worked for someone. They might not work for you, but they worked for someone at least once. Yeah. So just to just to clarify, we've got thirteen ways to save, and then ten ways to invest. Obviously, obviously, if you listen to the podcast throughout the year. There are many more ways, but this is just like a, a real snappy, punchy version. And there's also a document, like there's, there'll be a link in the show notes where you can get this list so you don't have to memorize everything. Um, you might even just take a, you know some notes down in your phone or whatever while you listen. Or if you're watching on YouTube, just have your notes app open um, and just maybe record a couple that you really like or just get the, the document that we've got to go along with this episode. So, Kate, Monique's off air. She's giving us a three-minute uh, timer that no one can see because if we start rambling, we've got to get through 23. So, where do we start? Let's Maybe we'll start with savings, but which? what's number one? All right. 
this is not in order of effectiveness, but the very first thing here, which I know you had a few thoughts on, Owen, is having your own herb garden at home so you can have fresh chives and parsley in your scrambled eggs, maybe some basil when you're making pasta. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, yes, I do have thoughts on this because I am trying this and it is hard sometimes. The parsley grows like a weed, so you can just chuck that anywhere and it will grow. But you mentioned chives. Chives are surprisingly hard to grow sometimes. They get eaten by these little bugs. And it's... Anyway, not a herb podcast. Um, but yeah, I think even rosemary. You know, rosemary is a really good one in all climates in Australia. Look at me putting my horticulture <laughs> cap for a moment. We're actually doing a hedge out of rosemary. So that we can, because we love rosemary on lamb and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff on potatoes. Super easy, super cost effective, rather than go with those like the English box and that sort of stuff. Yeah, and when you buy them from the supermarket, it's a tiny little plastic container with 15 yeah. chives individually yeah. placed in it. That said, you know what works really well is you know the ones in the pot? Mm. So you can get like basil in a pot because pa- basil doesn't grow in all parts of Australia very easily. So what you can do is you get the basil in a pot and you put that on your windowsill in like a very small plate of water uh, and it can last a couple months. So you don't actually need to go full garden. You can just have some like a window sill, uh, and it works really well. And you can just pick off a few leaves whenever you do your bolognese. Bolognese? I don't know how to say that, but um, yeah, I'll take it from Monique. <laughs> there we go. So herb garden, Kate. Yeah. Do you have any herbs? I don't because I'm going away and I think they will die if I don't water them for a month. But I do have some outdoor plants which have added a bit of life to my balcony. Okay, cool. Well, DIY herb garden. You can get seeds from Bunnings. You can, when you go to your supermarket, get the plant version and keep it for a few months. See if you can keep it alive. There's plenty of ways you can do this. Or just go and steal some of your neighbor's rosemary on your way past if they've got a a little... uh... Yes, and the neighbor's lemon tree. That's always a good one. Yeah, if it leans over, too bad. Yep. I like it. So that's number one. Number two, Kate, is something anyone could do. Yeah, organising a close or a book swap or something like that with friends and family. A lot of us have a few items that we're not really using anymore and it's a bit of fun if everyone brings maybe a few books and you gather for a for a lunch or a cup of tea or something and you just swap them and everyone gets a brand new book to read and... Yeah, Yeah. doesn't cost any money, but new entertainment, new clothes. I think money and chill about two thirds of the way through the year. That's sixty six percent for anyone that likes maths. Um, Through the year, that was unnecessary. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, we're talking about numbers. Um, So, we did a session where Monique talked about there are some stores that will buy back clothes as well, Mm -hmm. typically like designer style clothes. But if you do have some of that in your wardrobe just sitting there. Go and like give it back, get some cash, and then recycle. So it's all about you know reduce, re- reuse, recycle. Um, really simple. And then even a lot of community groups, like I know that they do this in my town, is they do like they have like the little I don't know what you call it, like a letterbox or like a book drop, where it's like community books where you can share books. You yeah, just like walk those up. mini libraries. Yeah, and you just walk up. It's on the street, and you just put your book in, and you grab another one out. Mm. It's like an honesty system, but it works. Uh, and then yeah, I mean clothes. I mean please, like so many people have so much that they don't need if like just give it to salvos if you're not getting uh anything for it just go and chuck it in there Hmm. yeah easy easy one anyone can do that um number three is a similar thing similar theme kate tell us a little bit about this yes so creating meals with similar ingredients instead of just having like five or six completely unrelated meals during the week. And so what this means is you reduce food waste. Say cauliflower is the feature ingredient for the Mm -hmm. week. You can use cauliflower in one meal as one type of ingredient. Maybe you've got roasted cauliflower salad in one meal, and then you also might do cauliflower rice with fish in another meal. So you can have use similar ingredients across different nights. So it just makes the food shop more effective. I'm going to put you on the spot here. You love prawn toast. What would you use the prawn toast? Like, how would you marry prawn toast with something else? Like, where would you get the synergy in the food? Well, I never cook prawn toast myself. <laughs> okay. Okay. A friend, family friend who can cook really well Go on. made the prawn toast. But uh, if you made prawn toast, you could also use the prawns to do a prawn cocktail. Oh, yes. I mean, I feel like that'd be a bit extravagant Actually, to make a lot of coming home do from work. Use prawns at Christmas. There's probably excess prawns lying around. Yeah, well, you can barbecue them the next day. Yeah. Prawns in a salad. Smush the prawns up into a mince and make chuck it in a piece of bread. Prawn toast. Yeah. Is that how you make prawn toast? Anyway, um, so you could, I feel like this is a really good thing. Like you can, we talk a lot about the easiest way to save on food is to meal prep. So similar ingredients, similar meals makes a lot of sense, particularly if there's something more expensive. Um, 
we've brought this up before, but someone uh, was heckling me about using pine nuts in a salad. Obviously, you could use pine nuts on many things, <laughs> even though they are expensive. So you could make them go a long way by just lining up different meals. It's a good idea. Yeah. I like it. And uh, my sister had an app that she was using this year called Sorted Sidekick. I think it's a UK or US app. But what they do is they bundle up similar meals that have the similar ingredients. So they're like, here's your three meal ideas for the week and ingredients are similar across each, but they're completely different meals. So it reduces what you have to buy at the supermarket, reduces wastage, and you've got three different things to cook. That's great. I really like that, actually. Sidekick, sorted sidekick. Link in the show notes for anyone that's interested in that. That's a great idea. Um, so number four is finding a low-cost hobby. What would be a low-cost hobby, Kate? Yeah, hiking. I think hiking, hiking is yeah, a great yeah, low-cost hobby. Bit. Not Monique like, likes to make things. Yes, knitting or crochet. Yeah. You um, look very confused saying those words. I was like <laughs> just trying to get the nod of confirmation to be like, yes, that is the thing that I do. <laughs> um, yeah. What but else? Even Anything like else? getting involved in local sports groups, op- often they don't cost that much. You might just mm. have to donate a small fee for court hire or things like that. Um, local drama groups, there's all sorts of activities that you can get involved with that don't cost that much, but give you community and connection. And they're a lot of fun. Yeah. It actually is. There are so many ways to do it. Um, Even in January, this this January, um, just trying to explore local parks and things like that, like hiking. Yes. But it could just be even just like going on a walk, you know, multiple times a week or setting yourself a target for the year. I'm going to visit 10 or 15 parks or hikes. or Many communities have local walking groups. So if you look up for the local community house or community center or uh, university of the third age or things like that, they'll do activities where community members can get together and learn about different topics or go on activities together. And I remember someone in Brass Corps mentioned in the forum that they like to pick up hobbies that double as gifts. Mm. So um, I think they were making beef. They learned how to make beef jerky and then different family members were getting given uh, different flavors of beef jerky as gifts. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a unique choice, but someone also mentioned making candles, yeah, all sorts of things like that doubled as Christmas gifts. I like it. So, there are so many ways to find a low-cost hobby. And a lot of it just is just creating something or setting yourself on a bit of a challenge if you need to, you know, if you want something to motivate you to go and do it. Uh, having those groups, I know you ch- you started with the um, the running groups on, I think it was Saturday morning, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it yeah. was 5.30 a.m. So it drops Whoa, off during the winter. don't let that put you off. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's, if you, most areas sure have a, a local park PM run. for the night owls. Local park run groups yeah. that you can walk or run short distance and they're pretty much all over the world. Mm. I like it. I like it. Um, so number five is detoxing from TV. Which can save money, it turns out. Yeah, so giving yourself a 30-day TV streaming platform detox where you unsubscribe from all those services, even YouTube Premium, and you actually find some hobbies during the month or read some books or make the effort to go out and catch up with more friends that you haven't seen recently or find something new that you haven't tried before that's always been on that list of, I'd like Mm. to give that a go. I'd like to write a song. I'd like to write a book. I'd like to join this group that you haven't done, then you can, you've got 30 days detox from TV that you can put that effort in. I like it. I wouldn't even know where to start to write a song. Probably just go over the piano and just bang down on the, the keys and see what happens. But um, Most people have something on that list or at the back of their mind they want to try, but they don't have enough time. And TV mm. and movies kind of just suck a lot of time in our evenings. This is true. That's a great point. Like you can do anything. You can... Um, try and fit in a run. You can um, spend time with friends if you just check in. Like Christmas time is a great time of year or around the break is a great time of year when you can take stock of like relationships and do I need to do better with this relationship? Do I need to do better with that one? And maybe that means just spending time with friends and family. Like just actually putting side time aside and being the one who does instigate things. Like does start the conversation. Hey, do you want to catch up? Hey, do you want to do this? Yeah, I found a lot of people just don't ask these days of, do you want to do this activity? And so you have to be the one to instigate that if yeah. you want it to happen. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, so, but you can try 30-day challenges for anything. Like I've done it for exercise before, to start running, mm. cooking even. Like just give yourself little, they're quite fun. 30 days is a, it's not too long, but it's also good enough to actually set something up to do a 30-day challenge. I'm actually catching up with a guy tomorrow. His name's Nick Crocker. He's like one of the, the best uh, venture capitalists in the country. 
uh, maybe in the world. And uh, he has he wrote this article. This is a digression in 2013 called The Elephants. It's where he got four of his mates. Like he was one of the four, and every three months they have to catch up and they have to talk about their most vulnerable things with each other. Like, how am I going with my relationships? Mm. How am I going with my money? How am I going with my career? How am I going with this, that, and the other? And they formed like a little tribe and they just kept this thing going for many, many years. One of them sadly passed away since, but um, it was like building a relationship with your friends and a deliberate reason to catch up, something you cannot avoid. And it's just such a good idea because I find this particularly with guys is we often don't catch up without any purpose like it's often like it's footy or it's going to do something like go to go out or something like that but we don't Mm -hmm. actually just catch up and just have quality time so um i think for most people like if you just try and form that regular catch up with people great way to spend some time rather than spending it on the tv kate hack the system point hacks super popular in the community how can you do this yeah, so if there's a store that you go to a lot, like Coles or Woolworths, actually work out their point system, like everyday rewards for Woolies or flybys at Coles, and actually sign up. Now, yeah. I'm saying this and I haven't done that myself. <laughs> Every time I go to the store and they're like, swipe your everyday rewards card, I go, next. But <laughs> um, I have done this with other stores like Dimmicks, where you actually, if you make sure you have your card or you just give them the details each time, you get yep. to make use of their reward system. Maybe you get discounts every so often or vouchers. So if you're already spending money there and it's not going to encourage you to spend more, um, make use of their reward system and understand how that all works. Yeah, and this is a really simple way that anyone can get off the ground. Now, <clears throat> we do we do associate with people who have credit cards uh, and use those for point hacking as well, which it, uh, that's probably the most bang for your buck, but it's also dangerous in the sense that if you are not the type of person who pays back your credit card instantly, then you're going to get caught out big time and it's going to really hurt. So we try and advocate against that as a general rule, but there are many different ways to point hack. Um, You know, we talked about one in 2022 where you could just download the 7-Eleven app uh, and connect it to your velocity and you get 11 times the points and seven times the points if you just fill up. And that was just a free kick. You know, so just looking around and paying attention to these things. Yeah, if you fly a lot, making use of either the Velocity or the Qantas Frequent Flyer programs because they they link up with heaps of different companies now. Yeah, we we talked about this. Well, we went for a long time without actually having anything for all of the flights that we had to do Mm. for recordings and stuff. Um, I can't believe we went that long without actually just switching it on, like just putting the number in. Like, we'd have saved us so much money. So, anyway, that's it. Just point hack. Yeah. Um, great. And also, like those cash, we've talked about it a lot in the past year, but cash rewards and honey and things. So, every time you're going to buy something that's kind of mm. more than $50, maybe Google to see if there's a discount code. It's even worth asking if it's a large company, like I probably wouldn't do it to a small business, but if it's a large company, They've often got a discount code active somewhere, so you can message their customer support and say, oh, is there anything, if I'm going to purchase something today, is there any discount codes that might be active for me? Yeah, um, the Honey uh, extension for the browser, I reckon that probably saved me $400 this year. And I didn't, like, it just is in my Chrome browser. Didn't do anything. Just saved me 400 bucks. Yeah. It doesn't cost you anything, so may as well do it. And if you're booking a big trip and you you know you're oh, going to yeah. be booking lots of hostels and activities, make sure you get cash rewards because I've set... I've got a few hundred dollars cash back just from making sure I used it when I was going to Hostel World and Booking.com and all those other websites. Kate's gone on a hostel tour of Europe. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, no, the other thing uh, I would add is we've been using, we, we don't have, there's no like affiliation here, but we've been using raise rewards for our bookings for our hotels for work. Super simple. Hmm. Um, get a few hundred dollars invested in some ETFs for us for nothing. All right. Number seven. If sell you it. haven't used it for two years, try selling it somewhere. Yep. So what exactly are we talking about here, Kate? So walking around your house, and, and this was a suggestion mm. from a family member as well, chances are you've got a few things lying around that are collecting dust that have stayed in a box for a while. Maybe you moved five years ago and there's still mm. things that you haven't unboxed from that, that box at the back of the wardrobe. So there might be a few things that you can go, all right, this summer I'm going to mm. get a few of these items that I haven't actually used for a few years. I'm just holding on to because I am and put them on marketplace or gum tree. And even if you don't sell it, is there someone in your f- friends, family, community that you can give that item to? Yeah. Re- repurpose it. Um, I remember a mate of mine, I won't name him because it's very shameful, but um, he uh, he didn't know that you could sell stuff online. Hmm. 
So, and he's a finance guy. That's what makes it funny. Uh, so I was like, dude, you can just sell this stuff. Just like you can sell your shares, you can sell your unused stuff from the back of yeah. the wardrobe. Um, but no, I, I, I just, it's it's actually a super easy thing to do with Facebook, in particular Facebook Marketplace. You get a few scammers on there, so don't be sending your credit card details anywhere. But um, yeah, you can sup- like you can liquidate things around your house. Like I was just thinking as you're saying that, I've got an old, if anyone wants to buy a Nectar 15 fireplace that I bought during COVID, which we're going to install... Don't know, but we're not putting it in anymore, so just let us know. It's really specific. Yeah, it's a fireplace, so if anyone wants that. Um, I do have some old power tools, actually, that I did binge on and I no longer need. So I'm thinking there's probably like a 1000 bucks that I could recoup and then go and spend it on something I want to spend it on, mm-hmm. or even getting away for a couple of nights. That's cool. Okay, so sell it online. Use Facebook Marketplace or Gumtree or even your local community groups. Like a lot of There are a lot of Facebook groups, Reddit groups, like all these types of things that – allow you to connect with people in your area, mm. particularly if you're in a regional town. I remember my sister sold all of her Lego, um, for, I think it was like 250 bucks, mm. just for nothing. Like, Lego is valuable though. Lego is like At gold. Myers, you see the price of some of those huge kits. It's crazy. Yeah, it's insane. Um, don't lose a piece. So number eight is hunt for food that is close to expiring, maybe not expired, but close to expiring to see if you can scoop a bargain. Yeah. So a lot of supermarkets, if it's maybe a couple of days out from its expiry date. Discounted. Discounted. Monique reminded me that there's often bargain sections at the supermarket this year. Yeah. Yeah. Every year, in fact. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so. laughs> well, I hadn't really thought about it before. Um, and But also at, at markets, often there'll be close yeah. to closing time, like Brown Market in Victoria, um, there'll be deals at the end of the day when they're trying to get rid of the bread, for example. I feel like it was Monique, your grandma or someone that would go to the market, or maybe it's not. Maybe I'm just like so stereotyping. Anyway, back to uh, <laughs> that wasn't the case, but people would go, like would know when, say, like bakers or butchers or local community, like farmers markets, would know when it ends, and then they would go at the end of the day. And because the people don't want to take it home or they have to throw it out, they'll be like, I'll take all 10 loaves of bread for $5 or something like this. And you just basically take it from them. And then you can repurpose it. You can make cakes. You could, um, you know, make dishes that you probably need a lot of ingredients for. Even like, I remember in Victoria, there's the Dandenong Market. Dandenong, um, it's a really like culturally rich area. And um, there's all different like uh, ethnicities there that, that have different meals and different like fruits and vegetables and you go there and you can get like a box of mangoes for like three dollars so it's like if you wanted to i don't know what you make with mangoes but surely something well, mango lassi <laughs> yes or mango smoothies mango smoothies like you can go there at the right time of the day and save so um yeah i was very fortunate kate i used to be a um, a manager of an iga supermarket uh when i was going through uni and all, I got to see like all of like the meats that were going to be discounted or the fruit and veg. And I'd be like, well, I'll take that. Like at the end of my shift, I'd be like, yeah, I'll grab that. Um, because then I'd just eat it that night or the next day or freeze it. So simple. Speaking of. Speaking of. Number the next nine. one is buying fruit and veggies that are in season. Mm. And my mum's told me mm. about this for ages and I haven't actually gone and investigated. But there's guides online. I've put one in the link, yeah. uh, the link document, which is a seasonal produce guide. So you can get to know in each season of the year, what is the fruit and veggies that are in season, what are grown locally in Australia that are often cheaper in the supermarket. So from December through to February, we've got apples, blueberries, blackberries, bananas, apricots, cherries, plums, nectarines, all of those wonderful stone fruits, the summer fruits. Everything, strawberries, please buy these because that means that they're getting to you fresher and there's more supply. So the prices are typically lower. Yeah. And they're often, they're made in Australia. Yeah. And they're not being stored in a a cold factory for months and months and months. And even over the summer, it's really fun. If you want an activity that doesn't cost too much money, going berry picking, there's lots of blueberry farms and cherry farms. I know in Victoria alone that you can go and make a, a day trip out of it, maybe go somewhere in the regional areas of your state and actually pick some berries and usually it doesn't cost as much as it will on the supermarket per kilo. Yeah, great. And yeah, have a bit of fun while you do it. Why not? That's great. So number 10 is pretty obvious. Like if you listen to a finance podcast and there's like a savings thing and they're like, don't try and lower your bills, like your utility bills, uh, you're probably doing it wrong. So this number 10 is 
pretty generic, but it's by far probably the most influential, which is just get your utility bills and all of the bills that are like subscription or automated down. Yeah, I think everyone, including myself, needs that annual reminder that any of those big bills that you're paying on a monthly or a quarterly basis, can you check in and see if you can get a better rate with your existing provider, with another provider? Maybe there's a better option for your new circumstances. You're not quite using as much internet as you were before, so you don't need that super expensive Mm. plan. Or um, there might be a better um, electricity provider for your area. Yeah. Yeah, easy. And we've talked about this before. State governments, there's a website where you can go, you can find like on every state government basically has incentives for energy, for various things. Sometimes you get free money just for checking your, if there's a better deal. Like yeah. literally you get just a better deal. You get money just for checking. And if there's other so subscriptions well and that aren't bills per se, but they're nice to have like Audible or Disney Plus that you know, You've subscribed for the last 12 months and you probably are going to subscribe for the next 12 months. They'll often give you deals if you pay for 12 months in advance. So if you're in the financial position to do so and you know for sure that you want this for the next 12 months, you can often get uh, 12 months for the price of 10 if you pay up front. Yeah. Uh, Apple, uh, sorry, not Apple, uh, Amazon's really big on this one is like you can pay in advance and save for Prime and all those types of things. And so is Disney. I think the last time I checked, Disney was 30% off if you paid in advance, mm-hmm. which is big. Yeah. Like, you know, it's 50 bucks and you're going to use it anyway, so you might as well just do it. Yeah, you just want to be sure that you... Yeah. Yeah, often apps as well. Subscriptions in apps will have quite heavily discount yeah. to annual subscriptions. Most subscriptions these days offer a buy it annually. The thing that really annoys me is like when you go to websites and they're like thirty nine ninety nine a month paid monthly but uh, sorry paid annually but it's monthly like it's expressed it tries to confuse people like it it's saying like it's an annual subscription but if you have to pay the annual to get that right it's only when you toggle like the thing yeah. that you get to see it's like oh 49 so dollars if you pay you monthly for 12 months but yeah but they they quote it in monthly so just pay attention to that but um yeah there's oftentimes a massive discount with most things to pay annually so give it a crack um Potluck with friends, Kate, number 11 on our list of ways to save. Yes, and this is one that has saved me plenty of money this year. And it's having, if you've got a group of friends that are happy to not always go out for coffee or not always go out for meals and just share between different people's houses or local park, especially in the summer. And maybe one time you do a barbecue and everyone Mm. brings different parts of a meal. So Instead of having to every pay everyone pay twenty or thirty or forty dollars a head going out to a restaurant, you might only have to pay twenty dollars for your designated item, like the burger buns. Yep. A question for you: Why do you think it's called potluck? I've got the answer in front of me. I've just googled it. I was trying to think of why it would be called potluck. I don't know. People bring things in a pot, and if you're lucky, it tastes good. The word potluck appears in the 16th century English work of Thomas Nash. Ooh, where are we going with this? And used to mean Quote, food provided for an unexpected or uninvited guest. The luck of the pot. There you go. So, the luck of the pot. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Not everything you tastes good. You learned something new on the show today. Um, pot luck with friends. Why not? Give it a crack. I find that's a lot more enjoyable too. You yeah. Often better conversations, more memories. Yeah, and it helps the host of the whoever's doing it. And if you've got like... Um, like, like sometimes people do this with their street at Christmas. Like they'll have like a street party kind of thing where they have like everyone brings something to the table. Like some maybe there's a barbecue or something like that. You bring something unique along. It's a good way to keep costs down and yeah. have a social event. Even this Christmas, I'm saving money because I'm hosting Christmas breakfast. I'm borrowing a trestle table from a neighbor. I've borrowed a Christmas tree as well. I've borrowed the Christmas decorations. Uh, I've delegated a lot of the different components of the breakfast. So... All in all, but hosting is going to be quite affordable for me. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I think good. I just have to buy some eggs. That's pretty good. Yeah, nice. Please go cage free. Anyway, so uh, in at number 12, we've got make money from your spare things. Or this could be think of Airbnb. Yes. Spare space, spare objects. You've got a spare room, a garage, a pool, a car park, a caravan, a lawnmower. There's websites yeah. that you can rent anything these days. So if you've got something that has value that you're not using all the time, find some websites. I've included some links to different things. Um, Airbnb, Uber. Yeah, yeah, there's even one called Swimply for swimming pools. Rent your pool. I was like, oh, you (laughs) can just take a group of friends. It was about $20 or $30 an hour and just 
go and swim at someone's head pool. Head over to, yeah. So <laughs> you just have to knock on their, I guess you book it through the app and knock on their door and be like, our group's here for your swimming pool. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if I'd do it, but it's it's clever. Just some creepy old dudes renting out his pool. <laughs> Some of them look like they were at apartment complexes. Oh, cool. Because um, okay. they look quite, they looked a lot fancier than just one person's pool. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm just thinking something like Joe Dirt. Um, anyway, show my age. Yeah, I'm Ge- if you're going with a group of friends, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> Gecko, rent your event equipment too. That's a big one because event equipment is so dang expensive. I've heard of Gecko before. So there probably is somewhere, some way to rent something. Like um, the really good one. Um, his car next door, which is recently bought by Uber. Um, that's what we've always used when we travel for work. If we need to hire a car, we don't go direct to the big international companies, mm. like whatever they are. We go to car next door. So you can rent a car from someone that's just got one nearby. And it's so much cheaper. I reckon we save like 70%. Mm. Like I went to the Gold Coast not too long ago. I rented a car. I think the quote that I got from like one of those ones at the airport was like 750 bucks. I ended up renting a car. And it was Limits on that too, right? I ended up renting one, a nicer car, brand new, for 300 bucks. And I was like, well, okay, why would I ever go to that thing in the airport? Um, anyway. You can even rent a boat or a caravan before you jump in to buy something that's going to be expensive. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't trust me with someone else's boat, but hey, why not? We'll, we'll uh, start you with just a canoe. Yeah, a canoe. Number 13, turn on Find My iPhone. Yes. So, this, is, this one caught me off guard, Kate. This one really caught me off guard. Yeah. I mean, Tell me each, a story around each this. year, I think my parents like to contribute at least one thing to this episode. Like in the past, it has been split the coffee, buy a large coffee and split it between two people, which famous, is cheaper than famous two savings small tip. coffees. What is that? Is that has made the Australian Finance Podcast? Yes. Yeah, so this year, they went off on a road trip, and like always, my dad left phone on top of the car. Yep. And uh, they got 30 kilometers away and realized the phone, the wallet, the license, they're all gone. They're not in the car. But my mum, because we taught her how to use this earlier in the year, had turned on Find My iPhone. So she was able to get that out, find where my dad's phone was, which was actually in the middle of the road back at the town that they'd been parked at. And uh, off they went back to the town, managed to get into the middle of the road and completely intact, found the phone and the wallet. Huh. So that saved them over $1,000 and a lot of hassles because it takes a bit of effort to get all your mm. uh, license and Medicare sorted, get another copy of them. And uh, I don't know if they had any cash, but definitely didn't have to get another phone. So definitely yeah. averted a mini crisis. There's another thing, um, air tags, which are just like little key ring type things that just sit on your devices, um, whether it's your keys, whether it's your... I don't know, whatever, um, you can actually put air tags in all your stuff and you can track it. Now, this is obviously a huge plug for Apple, um, but I'm sure that there is a Android equivalent. Do you have an Android Find My iPhone version, Monique? Yeah. 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 Just nodding straight up. Yes, of course. All right. There's, of course, there's something Apple for you, Android people. <laughs> <laughs> so. But I'm just, it's, it saved them $1,000 and over 10 hours of time. So could be something worth thinking about. Cool. Okay, so that brings us to the end of savings. So just to recap, we've got DIY Herb Garden, swap your clothes or your books, create a few meals with similar ingredients. Use that app, Sorted Sidekit. Thanks, dog. Uh, find a new low-cost hobby, 30 days Thirty days of free, no TV. Uh, points hack, uh, if you haven't used it for two years, try selling it online, aka your stuff. Use Marketplace or um, Gumtree. Hunt for close to expiring food. We don't want anyone eating expired food. Uh, this is not The Walking Dead. But um, number the, the number nine was buy fruit and veggies that are in season, which is always, they taste better anyway. Crush your bills with some annual discounts. Potluck with friends. Now we know it's for unexpected guests. Um, 12, make money from your spare things. And 13, turn on find my iPhone. What a wonderful tip. What a wonderful tip. If you're in the outback, turn it on. You never know where you might lose things. <laughs> um, so 10 ways... To invest is what we've got in front of us now, Kate. Let's start. Yes. So the first one, which can be a huge win for many people, is focusing on crushing your debt first. Okay. So before you're jumping into everything else, if you have debt like a credit card debt or a personal loan, that's often charging anywhere from 10 to 20% interest per year. So that debt is growing, but not in a good direction. You want to focus on paying that off first 
Uh, and we've done some episodes on that. We've got a course, free course on paying off your debt because that will help you mm-hmm. get to mm-hmm. a firmer financial footing than focusing on, on the other stuff. You can learn about investing. You can do all of that stuff at the same time. But focusing on your debt is a really good way to invest in your financial future. Yeah, we always say this. If you're paying 20% on a credit card, get rid of it because you're probably not going to get that from the stock market. So just get rid of the card first. And it might seem like it's a harder thing. It's not as sexy, but it is much sexier when you actually look at the maths behind it. So get rid of that. You also don't pay uh, in, you don't pay tax on saving money. That's one of the big ones where you should pay tax on any money that you make from investing. So uh, get rid of that debt. You'll feel better. You'll feel like a superhero once that's done. Um, trust me, I've been there with a personal loan myself. I know what it's like just to get rid of that thing. Actually, shout out to my mate, Glenn, who probably won't be listening to this today. He'll probably be somewhere overseas. But um, he had a loan and he got rid of it. So congrats. Took him about a year, just under a year to get rid of it. He wanted to invest, but I said, that's probably better to get rid of that thing first. And he did it. So he's stoked. He's so happy. And now he works more so he can <laughs> keep more, which is wonderful. So Glenn, kudos to you, brother. All right, number 15 is invest in your cyber security. Tell us about this, Kate. Well, there's been a few notable data leaks this year and people getting hacked and Mm -hmm. people getting scammed. So I think it's really important. You're building your financial future. How are you protecting it? So if your broker has options, can you add a stronger password? Can you add some sort of two-factor authentication or um, an extra step? that when you go to sell your investments, there's an extra step of security there. So if someone hacks and figures out your main password, have you got some extra security set up? Yeah, you can actually measure how long it takes to crack a password. And if you just have one of those like really simple ones without any like characters or whatever, you basically need like nine, I think you need like nine characters and also upper, lower case, blah, 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 to make sure that the computer can't crack it in under a year. So yeah, um, I would, yeah, focus on a stronger password you might have the same password for all your streaming services, but try and have a unique and strong password. And I've set up two-factor authentication on, I think, most of my brokerage accounts. So all there's the multiple that steps if someone's trying to go in and sell something. Some people will say you can invest in like a um, password manager and those types of things. Uh, that's that's valid too. You obviously just want to make sure it's secure as well. Like Apple Keychain does this, um, yeah. the Google Password Manager, but there's others out of the box as well. Yeah, maybe just think about whether if you're on public Wi-Fi, not just heading into your brokerage accounts and Absolutely. all of your sensitive data there. Yeah, so one of the easiest ways to get your password and stuff is just when you're connected to public Wi-Fi, hotel Wi-Fi, all this sort of stuff. It's called a man in the middle. Um, basically, another device can see what's being transmitted through the air. Like if you've ever wondered when you go to the airport and you click on like connect to Wi-Fi and there's like 50,000 Wi-Fi's, how does your computer know that? Well, it knows that because it's receiving a signal, mm. right? So it's receiving the signals of all the Wi-Fi's in the building. So that has to send a message which then identifies your computer. And then if you send a message out with your password, it's obviously encrypted, but if you try and connect to it, then other devices can see that as well if they have like Wireshark or one of those pieces of software. So the best thing to do is just to kind of keep any of that information secure. Yeah, and uh, just be careful this year, not clicking on any links. The scammers are getting a bit more sophisticated. You get texts that come through and look like they're from CBA because they can do various things in the background and it says log into your account, there's a notification for you and there's a link. So just don't click on any links. You can go straight to the website of your provider and log in that way and check the URL before you log in. Yeah, always just go direct. Never click on a link in an email or a text um, and always make sure you've got that that padlock in the in the menu, in the yeah. browser there. You see that where you put the, the web address, just make sure it's got the padlock. Um, you can actually click on that padlock, just so you know, and you can actually see where the certificate is issued. That's yeah. really important too. And there's probably other one, well, uh, other thing. You can actually, a lot of banks are giving you more features with your card mm-hmm. payment settings. So uh, I know in UP, you could go into the payment settings of the card and you could turn off international online purchases and international in-store purchases. So if you're planning to stay in Australia for a while, you can turn those off so that if your card details get stolen, someone can't go on a global shopping spree. What a shame for them but they can't take your money and spend money on Fifth Avenue or something. Anyway, um, so that's really smart. And you can do that as a business too, by the way. If you have a website or something like that, you can go into your Cloudflare account or your web host and you can block other countries from accessing your website. Yeah. I or think at least force them to do it. We a just got to focus on scam awareness every year because even very smart people get scammed every yeah. year. There's 
big stories that the even the government releases. Well, I think it's on the Scam Watch website of the, some of the stats and the stories of people who get scammed and there's, it's it's evolving and so you just got to be vigilant and look after your assets. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, one of the, the most powerful websites in Australia, which if I'm not mistaken, I think I think it was something like two, they deal with two million attempted breaches every month, is the government website MyGov here in Australia. Um, it's also connected to the ATO website and to Medicare and all those websites. So you can see why it's so important for hackers to try mm. and breach it, which is why it's so great that it is secure. Um, you know, we even did stuff recently uh, on the business podcast, the Australian business podcast, which if you're thinking of starting a business, that is the podcast you want to listen to ASAP. Um we did a thing recently where to set up a, a director ID, you needed to do that through MyGov, basically. You needed to prove who you mm. are. And everything is increasingly going to MyGov. So if there's a tax file number, if there's an ABN, if there's a company number, if there's GST, everything is going in that w- location over time. So make sure you've set it up properly. It's pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. There's... Superannuation's there. Everything's there. Yeah. Pensions. Hunt down your lost super. Um, even this year, I mentioned on Money and Chill setting up the Medicare link because you've got to link each individual service yeah, to your you MyGov account. So I had to, obviously, I'm a very reliable adult and I had totally updated my details. So yeah, it sure took a did. while to mm-hmm. link the Medicare because I had to, a few things were out of date, but got that sorted and was able to get my Medicare rebate paid out from a couple of years ago. So there might be some money there. And also looking at the Money Smart website or the State Revenue Office, because many people in Australia like millions of people have unclaimed money. I'm sure I've got some there somewhere. From insurance, from dividends, from just interest payments, from people that closed down accounts and they didn't have any payment details to pass things on. A lot of people have money. And so have a look. Just It's a fun thing to do actually at a gather- family gathering is like search up all your family members and then show them, hey, you've got $50 I'm over here, Uncle. I'm going to do this right now and see if I've got something. No results found. Damn it. I found results for some <laughs> family members, not for oh, you myself. Can, but- you can do it. Oh, my Lord. I think it'll help the older people in your family because... Oh, yeah. My grandma's on here. Yeah. What the heck? Well, yeah. Your name's pretty unique in Australia, so... Yeah, so I've, I'm probably the only one. <laughs> people, so, people are going to so... search you up now, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, interesting. There you go. Yeah, you found some. $53. Huh. Does it tell you where it's and from? My, my granddad, who passed away a very, 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 very long time ago. $37. There you go. Well, there you go. 90 bucks. I don't know how I'd get that, but uh, yes, yeah, so there we go. You probably have to, there's probably a, some information on how to Yeah, actually I'm sure there someone. is on this Find Unclaimed Money page. There you go. Well, Kate, you just saved my family 90 bucks. Thank you. Even though this is on the investing side, that's still money saved is money made. Okay, so um, pick one area of money and investing to learn more about in 2023. This is very similar to what's been on our list in the past, but this is number 17 on our list, one of the core tenets, if not the core tenet to investing, is just being curious how it all works, figuring it out. So how do they do that? Yeah. So something that we've mentioned on the finance or the investors or the business podcast, pick one topic and just do a deep dive this month. Put aside a few Mm. hours to really get to know that topic, look into the resources and just get curious about something and become your own expert on that topic. There's so many resources now. So I've done it before. I do a deep dive and then I'll just listen to 10 podcasts or a few books or Mm. a few expert interviews all on one specific topic if I want to know, get a broader understanding of all that because it puts the pieces of the puzzle together, the more sources and voices you listen to on that area. Yeah, it does. And we've got one podcast for every occasion. So if you want the finance podcast, this is the one that you're listening to right now, Woohoo! Uh, you can learn about saving money, making money, careers, super, all that stuff. If you want to talk about investing, like all different types of investing at a deeper level, that's the Australian Investors Podcast. It's the yellow. Uh, and the business podcast is our newest podcast, which has been a, received incredibly well. It's insane. Uh, the Australian Business Podcast, which talks about managing your taxes for a business, entrepreneurialism, um, <laughs> solopreneurs, um, like scaling your business getting investors into your business to fund your idea, venture, all that stuff. That's the Australian Business Podcast. But you know what, Kate? Like, we treat the podcast, we are very lucky. We treat the podcast as basically a chance to learn. You know, we talk a lot about like episodes like this where we do mm. ourselves. But like I'm learning from you uh, and you're learning from me and we're learning from everyone else that writes in and asks questions and stuff. And that's just wonderful. But we did a, um, 
a summer series last year uh, in t- or 2022, I should say, um, which covered all of the essentials. We went back to basics, but also had something for more advanced listeners. Um, so that is in your podcast player in January 2022. It covers all of the essentials. So deep dives on in particular uh, in, on topics. Go to those episodes. You'll see they've got an emoji in the title. We experimented. Um, number 18 is make sure you're using a high interest savings account. <laughs> wow, why is this important right now? Well, cash is part of your investment portfolio. But it's also, an asset class. Interest rates are up. Way up. And makes it tougher for people with a mortgage because I'm seeing my variable rate increase and increase and increase. Yep. But if you're a saver and you have a significant amount of money, especially an emergency fund that you've put aside, making sure you're in a really high interest savings account yep. anywhere, like I'm seeing ones at 4%, some are edging above that, Yeah, um, you're going to get a lot more out of your money and it could be quite significant. And if you have like more money than just your savings account, like we have a lot of people that are 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s listening to the show, if that's you, you don't need to invest in stocks just to get a return anymore. That is what is incredible about this. You, if, if you only want f- a 5% return on your money, you, you can just put most of them in cash or in like a savings account or a term deposit because you're going to get four, four and a half percent. Why would you take the extra risk of owning stocks if all you need is four to five percent? Just go and do that. Take the lowest amount of risk to get the return that you need. Savings accounts. And if you're a mortgage holder, like the three of us are here in the studio, go and use an offset account. Most of them, are for, they get them for free with your mortgage. Stick your money in an offset account and save on huge amounts of interest. Mm. Pretty simple. Yeah. And even some of the ones we've seen and spoken about recently, some of the banks with higher interest rates. Yeah, uh, to get you started. U Bank, ING, Macquarie, Up Money, Bank of Queensland. There's plenty yep. of more. And I know people love talking about it online and in the Rascor forum, but yep. they're just a few places to have a, a look at as something to start with when you go, okay, what, what rates are there? Yeah. It's pretty good rates out. Yeah, I definitely look around if you haven't in the last few months. Yeah, we've done. We recently did an episode on term deposits and savings accounts. If it's an emergency fund, don't put it in a term deposit. At least not all of it, because the whole point of an emergency fund is you can use it in an emergency. And if you lock it away in a term deposit, Mm. you could give up your interest if you break that term deposit. So maybe put some of it in a term deposit, but otherwise, just a savings account is fine. Um, Number nineteen, we're getting through the list. Sort out your tax return. And get a refund if you're eligible or pay the bill and you'll feel better. Yeah. Many people in Australia do get refunds. So that is money that you could use to pay off debt, sort out your emergency fund, even start investing. And uh, if you've put it off for a while, um, it's time to sort it out. Yeah, it's time to sort it out. You can even get a payment plan with the ATO if you are worried. Like you can extend it. Speak to your accountant because just by seeing an accountant, you can often get an extension so they can apply through the ATO portal. But then what you can do is you can also do a payment plan. So I've done this before where you have a huge tax bill and you're like, oh, I need to do something about this. Don't want to sell my investments because that would make a capital gain tax event. Like you can do it so that you smooth it out over 12 months. The ATO, contrary to what everyone thinks, the ATO is not out to get you. The people at the ATO actually want you to be okay and they want you to be able to like pay the money back eventually so Mm. they will work with you as long as you are clear with them and your accountant's clear with them like this is where i'm at and this is how i plan to do it um just be clear with that and you have quite a bit of discretion too on how fast you pay things back but if you don't have the payment plan you will get at what's called a general interest charge which is where you get interest panel like you're penalized with excess interest because you haven't paid your loan back effectively to the, the government. So get on the front foot, get it done. Uh, if you need to get your tax return done, don't forget those office expenses, those home office expenses that came in during COVID. There's basically this rule that um, you can have a claim for every hour of the week that you would have worked from home and done all these things for all of the stuff. Right. So then you don't really need to do anything special, to be honest, to get to claim that. So, um, yeah. And even putting a system in place for your next tax return, if you've already done it, to make things simpler, whether it's setting up folders in your inbox called tax, which you can just drag emails into during the year, whether it's setting up a Google Sheet where you can keep track of your donations, um, especially if you're like me and make it a little bit to lots of different places. So you don't have one concise statement from a company at the end of the year. 
Um, even using something like ShareSite to record your holdings. So you've got, yeah, if you've got shares and ETFs. data in one place, you can get some accurate reporting. Just yep. make your life as simple as possible. January is always a good time to do a bit of a refresh. And also life admin. checking in with your share registries to make sure your tax file number is recorded for every holding. Yes. Otherwise, you get withholding tax. So and, if you uh, love those dividends, um, go and check out Link Market Services, Computer Share. Those are the two big ones. Make sure your tax file number is in there. Um, when you get that piece of paper from the, the share holding that you have, use that number and that's how you log in. Uh, you can also just look your own name up with your tax file number and all that, or with your name and whatever. Um, I would say also that like, if you do donate to charity, um, typically you can you can set it on a recurring reminder, uh, a recurring payment, sorry. And that's so you know roughly what's coming out for the, for the regular giving. And the charities love that, by the way. So go and do that. Um, and finally, with your tax return, don't forget your franking credits. We all love franking credits. So um, those are wonderful. Make sure you tell your, AT, uh, your tax agent about them. Long-term investing makes it simple. Number 20. We've only got a couple more to go, Kate. Number 20. Review your portfolio. Yes. I like this. So the start of the year is a great time to do a mm-hmm. comprehensive review of your portfolio, especially if you're managing it all yourself. And look at how you've performed. Give yourself an annual performance review for your portfolio. Oh so <laughs> have a look at how you perform compared to some benchmarks. Um, ShareSite does that for you. Yeah. Is your asset allocation still what you want? Or suddenly do you have 90% cash when you only wanted 10% cash in that portfolio or something like that? Yeah. 90% I, cash. I don't know. That was a strange example. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that would happen in one year. Yeah. But um, the point is the same. Yeah. So Now's a good time. Check a review in. of your portfolio. Um, if you haven't done our ETF comparison activity and actually looked under the hood of the ETFs and gone, oh, what is this ETF actually investing in? Do I have any overlap? Do I have a lot of the same companies in one ETF that are also in this other ETF and I'm just overlapping holdings? Have I made my portfolio more complicated than it needs to be? Because simple often works better. Yeah, there's a uh, link in the, 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 the article for this podcast. There's a link there that takes you to that document so you can go and do it. And Go and check out the mini series. One of our most popular ever done. So yeah. super easy to do, and we walk you through it. Number twenty one, to plan to fail is to fail to plan, or something like that. Um, sort out your investment plan for twenty twenty three, Kate. Yes. So a good one. Once you've done your annual review of how you went in twenty twenty two and what your portfolio looks like, figuring yeah. out what you want it to look like in the coming year and what other goals you want to achieve with your finances. So. Um, if you've already put some goals in place, and they might be multi-year goals because they're for 10 or 20 mm-hmm. years, like reaching financial independence or making sure your super is fully funded for retirement, it's a good time to check in with your goals, maybe update your net worth tracker, see what you want to achieve during the following year. And I even, I often break them down. So instead of saying, I want to invest I want my portfolio to be worth this much, I'll say I want to invest this much this year because I can control yeah. in many circumstances unless unforeseen expenses, maybe my bathroom explodes, who knows what happens. That could happen. I Wouldn't don't know. would surprise me to be honest. But if something happens, there might be unexpected expenses. But working out, okay, so I'm going to invest $10,000 this year and I'm putting this much in this per- part of my portfolio, this much in this part, and even breaking down what that looks like on a monthly basis and whether I can automate any of the saving or investing parts of my goals. And even if you've got some big expenses that you know are coming up in 2023, um, making provisions or putting a plan in place for reaching those. Yeah. Uh, th- these two things, review your portfolio and set an investment plan. People often feel like, oh, I... You know, I feel really bad because I haven't performed as well. Like I haven't done that good. I feel like my investment strategy is all over the place. I'm making it up as I go along. All these things like imposter syndrome. But I tell you what, like everyone's making it up basically, even the professionals. So the, the, the thing to keep in mind is that your investment plan will change over time. Your portfolio will change over time. And that is completely fine. Um, we talk about the core and the satellite approach, using the core to have very basic long-term focused investments. And we tend to use ETFs because they tend to make sense for that. Uh, But there's many different ways you can do it. It's just about having something, something written down because that plan is when times get scary, when things go off track, when the unexpected happens, and it always does, it's just something to know, why am I doing this? Where did I roughly want to be? How can I kind of get there uh, in the best possible shape? And, you know, investment planning is really important. It could be as simple as, 
like you said, putting down how much you want to invest. Like don't anchor it to what your portfolio balance is because mm. that you're not in control of that. But just you know, keeping it really simple uh, is is the best thing to do. And and even if you didn't achieve some of your goals from the past year. Working out maybe yeah. why didn't you quite achieve those targets? Were they too ambitious to begin with? Were you setting an amount you wanted to invest that was just impossible with your budget and your current financial situation? Or was there something suddenly unexpected that came up? Or were you just spending a bit more than you wanted to spend during the year? And maybe mm. there's some levers you can pull, or maybe you're going to want to find some extra income sources or increase your salary during the coming years. So um, doing a bit of review in terms of that and what your goals were and why you didn't achieve them, there might be completely reasonable explanations or there might be some things that you want to work on because we can always improve in different areas. And one of the things that was in Annie Duke's book, How to Decide, was doing a pre-mortem. So thinking about what could go wrong during the year and what are some strategies that you could think of implementing now that would potentially stop those things happening. So it's going, okay, We get to the end of the year and I don't reach any of my goals. What are all the reasons why and what could I do about that now? Some things I can't do anything about and some things I could. Like 2022 is a really good example of this. The stock market fell. You know, that was, that hasn't happened for a while. So if you had your goal set at, I want to have $100,000 by the end of the year. And, and in that goal, you you assumed that you would save 70 and the other 30 would somehow be made up of the stock market's return for whatever reason. Well, it was completely out of your control. So, and by the way, those negative years are normal. One in every four years or one in every five, depending on which market you study, will be going backwards. That's normal. That's part of it. Let's keep focus on the long term. Um, so just focus on what you can control. Do it regularly. Make it a habit. Uh, number 22, second from last, Kate, is take our dang property course before you buy a house. Big, big decision buying a house. Yes. So please take the take the course. <laughs> it's a free course. It's not run by us. It's run by an yeah. expert mortgage broker and buyer's advocate who live and breathe the property market every day. So if you are thinking about buying a property this year, this course might just help you avoid making one expensive mistake. There's an inspection checklist that you can go through. So when you're actually going to those inspections with the real estate agent, Uh, hovering around as you walk around, you can actually go through and say, oh, have I actually looked under the carpet to see if there's a hole in the floorboards? Yeah. And I did a inspection of my own house and you can see that um, the audio was a bit meh, 50-50, but the video was, we've got some AFL players took it and they were like, they watched the video and they're like, I saw this thing that you did before I bought my house. And I was like, oh yeah, cool. Your house Uh, needed a lot of work though. That would have put me off. I wouldn't have bought your house. Yes, but I love that. Yeah. So I was like, yes. I know what to do. No termites, no <laughs> no water damage, no none of this sort of stuff. I can do everything. Yeah. So that's why I was super excited about it. But that gives you an idea of like how you can add a few hundred thousand dollars of valuation uplift in if you know what you're looking for. And so like you can I should do an updated version of it now. But um yeah, you can you can look at that video and you can see like some of the things that I didn't do and some of the things we did do when we checked that. And you only have 15 minutes when you inspect the house typically. Like, you can go back a couple of times. But in a hot market, you, d- you typically feel rushed. You feel panicked because you- this is a really nice house. Like Everyone's going to want this. So you want to move quickly. So you need to know, okay, I've got 15 minutes or I've got 20 minutes. How am I going to check for these key things? Go and take the property course. Uh, there's heaps of downloads. There's heaps of stuff in there. Um, just go and go and check it yeah. out. It amazes me how quickly we make that property decision compared to the amount of time and thought I put into my ETF portfolio. When the property decision actually has a much bigger impact on me financially, I well, it's I'm crazy. in debt like for the first time ever. Well, this is crazy. Like we're talking in some cities, like five hundred thousand, a million dollars. Like some people buying crazy houses for their first house. Massive decision. Yeah. So and and they might homework. just be buying emotionally when we talk about like all the stuff we need to do to talk about $500 of an ETF that's been around for dozens of years, you know. So go and like don't make the mistake on the first one. Um, go and take the course. Run by experts. Uh, you'll see some stuff in there from me as well. Um, check it out. It's heaps of fun. Last, Last but not least. but not least, if you haven't already... 2023 Mm -hmm. could be the year that you start investing. Yes. And you start investing with small amounts. You can start investing with $5, $500, Mm -hmm. depending on what platform you use. 
And you might be trying something like micro-investing or robo-investing or just trying a brokerage account that seems fairly simple to you. We've got episodes and resources on all of this, but it's it's a process and it's a journey. And if this is your first year of investing, you're going to need to put in some work and learn about it and understand some of those basic concepts. But it's also a fun journey and it can be really enjoyable to actually learn about how you mm-hmm. can invest in companies and businesses and start building your wealth over the long period of time. Yeah. You can start now with less than five bucks. Um, you can start with 500 bucks. You know, when we started, it was minimum $500. Uh, it, it's super simple. Now, Aussie Firebug, friend of the show, lovely fella, um, he he said at the Rask event recently, he said, that, you know, the first 100000 it sounds like a lot of money. I fully appreciate that. But uh, if you follow his story, it's pretty remarkable. The first 100000 is the hardest 100000 And it's kind of at that point where people go, this has been so hard, I haven't got anywhere. But then if you get to 100000 and your your portfolio has a 4% dividend, roughly, that's 4000 bucks. You're like, holy moly, I earned $4,000 for doing nothing. And that's when this snowball of, my gosh, look at this amazing thing called investing really starts to kick in. It takes a few years to get there, but you can start now with just a few dollars. Like you're never going to get there unless you start. So take that step in in 2023. Is it if this is your first time listening to our podcast, if this is your first time you've never even invested, it's your first investment, everything is going to be okay. Uh you can start with just a few dollars on one of these platforms. Don't risk it all. We always say investing is like a three year apprenticeship. It takes time to learn the ropes and to feel like, okay, everyone else is kind of just figuring it out too. You can start with five bucks, add five bucks a week, add five bucks a month, do whatever you want to do, whatever works for you. And don't overthink it because if it's only five bucks, you'll be okay. Even if it's 500 bucks or $5,000 in the scheme of your life, you're going to be okay. Mm. And this is what makes people wealthy. This is what gets them financial independence, not keeping their money in a bank. Yeah. We can't stress that enough. We've also got a new investor checklist episode on the podcast and I've linked to it in the document as well, which steps you through all the things you want to think about before investing, like paying off debt and building an emergency fund, understanding the basics, opening a brokerage account. Sorting out your super, yeah. Because it can feel overwhelming and I know a lot of us write... Uh, things on our New Year's resolutions like get fit, start investing, get a pay rise, and we don't go to really... Europe, <laughs> yeah. buy a house. <laughs> and these kind of things are quite big goals. And so, how can we think this year when you're setting your New Year's resolutions? If your goal is to sort out your finances or get started investing, what are some ways you can break that down into smaller steps that you can actually achieve over the course of the year? And one might be going and listening to some of our previous investing podcasts, taking some of our free investing courses. There's so many other books and resources out there that we share on the show that can help you get started and breaking down that get started investing to smaller, smaller goals. Yeah. Heaps of free courses. What I would say, if I was starting right now, even if I had debt and even if I didn't have an emergency fund, I would still chuck five bucks in a platform. Yeah. I would still do that because you'll get used to the emotion of it and how it works. But that doesn't mean like you shouldn't pay down the debt. I would absolutely say that. That is the priority, but you can get a feel for it. Whereas in the past, we used to have to do the thing called paper trading because there was no such thing as like a $5 investment. You you just have to kind of like play the games that they were available online. Yeah, so you can see your $5 go to $4.50, then back to $4.70, then up to $5.10. And before Um, you start putting serious money in, you can sort out your super. You can get on top of your tax. You can consolidate your debt. You can start to pay down your your debts. You can um, speak to your accountant or find one. There's so many things that you can do. You can try out multiple brokerage accounts. You can point hack. You can do all of these things without it costing anything, you know. And that's the that's the beauty of all the things that we've got on the list today. So yeah. just to recap, the final ten from our list, the ten ways to invest. And so investing is, you know, we say saving is a form of investing. So crush your debt. Invest in cybersecurity, which is really important, particularly after all the things that have happened in Australia. Set up your MyGov account so that everything works and you get your rebates, your your tax file numbers are in the right places. Pick just one area of money you're investing. Maybe it's ETFs, maybe it's super, maybe it's like minimizing taxes. Pick one thing to learn about this year and become an expert in it. You'll have that for life. Make sure you're using a high interest savings account or an offset account if you have a mortgage. Uh, Sort out your tax return, whether it's good or bad or ugly, just get it done. Review your portfolio. We've got a full comparison activity to do, a document. Super easy. 
sort out an investment plan. Could be on a napkin, could be in a Google Doc, could be in your notes app, somewhere you'll remember of it, set a calendar reminder and do it. Uh, take our property course. It's totally free. Whether you are a first home buyer or not, this is probably good practice anyway. A lot of people, even once they own property, still think that there's a lot of risk in it. Go and take the course. It's free. And finally, Kate, just invest. Invest something, anything. S- start with a tiny amount. Yeah. So there's a great list of things. Yeah. 23 things sounds a bit overwhelming, but just make this simple and pick one thing or one thing that your friend told you about recently or one thing that you wanted to do for a while. Write that down right now in your notes app, on your vision board, whatever it is, and then start writing down how you can actually implement that. Some of these things are really easy to start doing and some might take a bit more time, but just pick one thing and try it. Yeah. And if you've got a friend or a family member that's looking to get involved, we've got so many wonderful people in our community, whether it's inside our membership, which is RAS Core, you know, our 18,000 students, um, whatever. A lot of people don't have access to this stuff. They don't even know it exists. Like we chatted to a financial advisor uh, just the other day who said, I didn't even know this many people wanted to talk about money at the event. <laughs> so, like, there's that many people out there? You'll be surprised who needs help or who wants to talk about this stuff. So share this podcast with your friends. Uh, share the document that Kate's put together, which has all the resources. Just go and share it with them. You never know, you know, who could be like your friend that's interested in this stuff and it could really change their life. Yeah. And uh, if you try any of these things, send us a message on social media. Our links are in the description. We'd love to hear about your yeah. money and investing journey during 2023 or jump in the Rascal community and leave a message there. Yeah. We've got a massive year ahead of us. Uh, it's going to be so much fun. So many people wanted to get on top of their money now. So Kate, this has been great. I'm so I'm so grateful that we get to do it again. So yeah. this is 2020. This is 2020. <laughs> this is 20 ways, 23 23 ways, ways to, to save, save and invest 20. in 2023. I love it. Tongue twister. But hey, thanks for joining me. We got through it. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rask.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.